All right, gonna continue with the UEFI development series here. Where I left off, I believe, we're just loading a kernel. It's been a little bit, but if I go ahead and load the kernel, it can be a, a plain flat binary file. It can be a portable executable like we have here or an elf file, um, executable and linkable, however you say that. And it loads it and it just loads, you know, a screen with a couple colors to prove that we can load a program. And that's all, that's all good to go. So it's not quite handing off control though from EFI from UEFI services over until your own OS or whatever you want to run. EFI is still running boot services in the background. It still has some stuff going on. So if we want to fully go over into our own implementation of whatever we want to do, we have to do a couple of things, mainly exiting boot services. And a key component of that is getting a specific key value from the memory map that the firmware provides through this get memory map boot service call. So I'm going to add in code to get the memory map, maybe print out the values just so we can see what we have, what we're working with. And I'll also put in a call to get boot services so we can prove that we can load a program and everything is fully under our control. We're not still in EFI world at that point. So that's what I want this video to be and I'll get on with that. So we can add basically the needed things to the EFI.h file here. I'll go to my boot services table at the bottom. Exit boot services, I don't think I have in here yet. Not yet. Get memory map we'll need first though, so I'll add that in. That'll be with the memory map call. So it's just gonna be git memory map. Add that in here. Looks like the last thing I had was allocate pool, so I'll just put it above there probably. That's fine. This is in section 723. I'll grab this and we'll have to fix their formatting, because they don't like to have things be correct. Why would they? Get rid of that slash. We don't need that there. All right, so it gives us some values we can fill out, the complete size of the memory map in bytes. We have the memory map itself, which will be a pointer to a buffer that contains the map that is of the memory map size and size. It gives us a value for a key that we need to pass into exit boot services to fully exit. The firmware verifies that the key matches the last call to get the memory map. And so it gives you the key value. And then the memory map is basically a list or an array of a bunch of memory descriptors. The descriptor size is the size of one of those and the version, if there's future versions with different values in there. So the, all the memory map is, is an array or a list or a map of different regions of memory, each of which a given size and with a given purpose or a given type. So memory descriptor here is one of the descriptors in the memory map, which is just a pointer to one of these memory descriptors, which I don't think I have yet. No, so I'll put it, I'll just put it above here. Just copy that over. Okay, so a memory descriptor has a specific type. What is the purpose of this region, this area of memory? It has a start of physical memory and virtual memory. UEFI starts up for 64-bit that I'm working with, x86-64, it starts up in long mode with everything being identity mapped. So it'll have the same physical and virtual address. However, in the descriptors themselves, it will not have a virtual address, at least on my setup. It's reported as zero, but the physical start will be accurate. Uh, the number of pages is how many four kilobyte pages that the memory takes up. So if you divide the if you multiply, rather, the number of pages by 4096, 4 kilobytes, you'll get the actual amount of memory starting at the physical start address, is what we're going to say. We we'll also have attributes such as write protect or write through or other execute protect, other bits you can check, non-volatile, I believe, if it's runtime, if it's a mask for the ISA. And this gives more info on those. I'm not going to go into those really. One key thing to keep in mind here that can be annoying is that this memory descriptor is not guaranteed to be the same size as the actual descriptors returned by hardware. I've found there's usually padding of 8 bytes, either at the end or somewhere in here, where if you take the size of this descriptor, whether it's pa if it is packed, it'll be probably 40, because this will be padded out to 8, so it'll be 8, 12, sorry, 8, 16, 24, 32, this will be padded to 40 bytes, but the actual size of the descriptor returned by firmware and this descriptor size variable I've found is usually 48, so 8 bytes more than this. So we can't just offset from memory map as an array to get the right descriptor. We'll have to do a little bit of a massaging of the data, pointer arithmetic, but we'll get to that in a minute. So the type 
that we need is described in the allocate pages function. So allocate pages I should already have. I think I have allocate pool instead, actually. We can add allocate pages if we want, but I'm probably just going to be calling allocate pool for the memory. So maybe I can worry about that later. But the types we'll need are the memory types here, since that's described within the memory descriptor. It's just the uint32, but the memory types are going to be in this enum, so I don't think I have that. Well, I have a memory type for a pool type. Oh, I guess I already have that. Okay. <laughs> so we got that before sometime in the past, but the memory types here are there specific types of the memory regions that are going to be returned in the memory map in each of those descriptors. So reserved is reserved for EFI. We'll have loader code and data, boot services code and data, runtime services. Conventional memory is just free to use. Uh, unusable is unusable for some reason. Maybe there's bad blocks or something. ACPI reclaim we can get later if we set up ACPI. Non-volatile storage I don't think we can get later. Maybe, maybe not. Memory mapped I.O. and I.O. port space are used for devices like PCIe or something else. Something on a device bus usually that has hard, hard mapped uh, memory I.O. So you write to a specific port or a specific address that's not necessarily in your physical RAM. It's just within the address space that your processor has access to. And that's mapped to a specific device. So usually we can't mess with those. PAL code I think is also for, for something else for firmware. There are explanations of these, I don't remember. Uh, here, memory type usage before and after exit boot services. I think that's chapter two. Or is it still chapter seven? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> the memory types before exit boot services here in section 7.2, memory allocation services. So reserved is not usable. If, if for example, we want to get a total count or Otherwise, sort of delineate which types we can actually use in our code later if we want to pass in a memory map to our kernel, which would be useful. So I'll pass it in probably as a kernel parameter. But if we want to, you know, look at and query the memory types, which ones can we actually use as part of an OS or later on? Reserve memory we can't use. The ones we can use are usually loader code and boot services code. Those are fair game. Runtime services, unless you want to not use runtime services or remap them later, we might not be able to use those. Conventional memory is free, unallocated, unusable, we can't use because it's errored. ACPI tables you can reclaim later after exiting boot services if you set up ACPI, but I'm going to say that that's off limits until then, probably. Uh, memory non-volatile storage is used only by the firmware, so we can't use that, can't use memory mapped I.O or port space, and PAL code is also reserved, so can't use that. Persistent memory should be usable. It's the same as conventional, it's just persistent, so it, it should last between reboots. And unaccepted is something we can't really use. The only difference there is after exit boot services, this tells you basically what you can use, which is loader code and data, boot services code and data. Can't use the runtime. Conventional, not unusable. This just goes over, I think, what I just said. That gives it better. You can look in the ACPI for the S1 to S whatever states, S5, I think, for the different sleep states. So maybe you can use some of this memory in some of those states or not, but typically they're going to be reserved. Uh, but that's okay. So I'll just basically get a count of probably loader code, boot services code, conventional, and persistent, since it operates as conventional. I'm assuming that's available. But the other memory types I'm not going to mess with if I want to get a count of all the memory in my system. So I might want to do that. But anyway, that's getting a memory map. I'll also add code for getting boot services, or exiting rather, exiting boot services. I don't remember. No, I don't remember. Protocol image, maybe. Under image, okay. So 746 is exit boot services. So I'll just add that into my table down here. A boot services table. And the nearest thing, I guess, would be the watchdog timer, so I'll put it above there. This will be a type def. It doesn't, they didn't put type def, of course. Why would they ever ensure their documentation matches what is actually needed to program? I don't know. So 
So that's in 746. So what this does is a call. It calls to exit and fully transfer control over to your OS. You should clear out some areas of the boot services table as well, which it says down here. I may or may not do that. It's not really needed if you're going to reset later for testing anyway, but you probably should if you're going to pass in. Uh, if you're not going to null out that stuff in memory later, you probably should do what it says and zero out all the console inputs and outputs in the boot services table and then recompute the CRC32. I'm not going to mess with that because I haven't needed to yet, but you need to get a map key. And the map key comes from getting the memory map, a call to get memory map. You have to not change it, so don't allocate any extra memory, don't free any of the memory, because that can add and de-add, <laughs> and that can allocate and deallocate descriptors in the memory map itself. So you don't want to change it, you don't want to mess with memory after you call that, get memory map, and before calling exit boot services, just leave it as it is, uh, and you won't have an issue with that. So it returns a map key, you pass it to exit, you pass it the image handle that you booted up in, and you should be good to go. So we'll see if we can't do that. I'm probably also going to move some of this stuff into another function just to have other things going on. Let's say I have a library, if I live or something like that. And we'll just edit that. So these will be like helper, I don't know, definitions that aren't in let's say efi.h or the uefi spec. This will just be extra extra stuff like the elf and pe headers and, and other helper definitions. I'll move some functions in here eventually, probably. I just want this file to be a little bit cleaner so we can move some of that in. Make sure that's all right. Okay, because I'm going to be putting in a type def into there. I'll just put it at the bottom after that stuff. And we'll say we can put in, actually I can put in the kernel parameters. Which I don't remember what I call kernel parms, so that I can include it in the kernel as well and not have to have these things be separate. So the memory map I'm going to fill out, but I'll do that in a second. So we'll say defined in efi live.h. can make it external if I declare it. Nah, that'll be all right. So kernel parameters, we'll say example. Okay, so we have a memory map here. I could change that to be the actual memory map definition. I'll probably change and have actually a different. I don't need this right now, let me move that out. I'll actually have a, a different setup here where we need, we need a certain amount of metadata that's contained when we call get memory map, when we get the memory map back, we have to pass in some values and get back some values there. They're usually all pointers for that. So all these values here, I'm basically just gonna have those contained in a sort of object or a structure, a container, if you will. And we'll say it can be our own memory map type. I'll say maybe memory map info or data. I'll just say info, that's probably fine. So we'll have a uint in, and we can pass in this thing and then use its sort of addresses to the values so we won't have to pass in pointers. The memory map I'll keep as a pointer, but the other ones are sort of discrete values. They can be actual uints there. So I'll say memory map and uh, associated data, associated metadata. Then we can have memory map info be a parm to this. I'll just call it mmap, and that'll be the kernel parameter there. Okay, so I don't think I have to mess with the kernel here. I can have that be defined in here, in this new file. It'll take in the kernel parms, the GOP mode will stay the same, so that will be okay. Just put main there, all right, okay. Move that. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> that splits down. That's very annoying, huh? Okay. I'll just do it this way because I don't know what I'm doing. All right. So this is where the kernel parms and everything are at. Reading the file. I'm going to add another another function to the main menu here. 
and also probably change the timer just to call close. I think I call close event somewhere down here. Yeah, for the scan code. So I'm going to change to close the timer event because this came up when I was testing. This might make like an infinite number of timers, maybe only on QEMU and not hardware, but just to prevent that. Whenever I create a timer, I just want to make sure nothing's there first. So I'm going to close the timer event before I make a new one. <laughs> that way there's only one active at any one time and I don't have to worry about any errant events still happening because they could come up and print over our screen if there's stuff going on in other areas. Uh, but anyway, besides that, let's say load kernel is going to be the last thing on the list. I can add a print memory map function. We'll just do that. We'll say print memory map. And I can add that above here. So I know I have to do these things here. We can go ahead and print it out first. So what do I want to take into there? Probably nothing. Yeah, I don't need to take in anything to this. Okay, so if I want to print a memory map, I'll probably just get a key just to prove that it works. And I can clear the screen, which is going to be clear out. Okay, so if I want to print something to get the memory map, and I also want to get it for kernel parms, I'm actually going to have another function that'll just be to get the memory map itself. And then we can call that so I don't have to duplicate it. I can have it in one area. It'll be a getter, but not a setter. And if we have this memory map info struct here, I can put that and we can just fill that out probably. I'll call it mmap. If I want to set the values, I should pass a pointer to there. So I'll do that. And I'll call get memory map with the address. Okay. And right now this will just return success and do nothing. So it'll just say press any key to go back. It won't do anything. That's what I'm hoping. If I memory descriptor needs a semicolon, so it's in 132, here it does. Okay, yeah, these need semicolons because it's not, it's not a function parameters, yeah, okay. All right, so print memory map does nothing. It says press any key to go back. That's what I wanted. Okay, so when I'm printing the memory map also, I'm probably just going to clear or close the event so it's not printing over the values. So I should not see the timer pop up. Yeah, so it doesn't pop up in the lower right, but if I go back, then it should come back because we're making a new timer. So that's all I wanted to do, not have infinite timers be created every time I enter the main menu and not, or not. Uh, so, okay, how do I get the memory map? Well, we have to call BS on that and call get memory map. But we need a certain number of values there. And there's also a couple discrepancies that I'll explain. So I want to get the initial memory map size so when I call get memory map, what this actually does is give you a pointer to the size. On input, this is the size of the buffer allocated by the caller. On output, it's the actual size returned by firmware, if it's large enough or the buffer needed to contain. So really, you can call it with a size of zero, because you don't know how big the map's going to be. Or you can call it with all of memory, and it'll return the actual one. If you call it with a size of zero, this will give you an error. It'll give you an error for buffer too small if you call it with a buffer that's too small. That's normal. That's expected. It should not give you success unless it's basically exactly the right size or it's too big. So I'm looking for buffer too small and then the actual size that we need to allocate a buffer for. Yeah, the actual size we need to allocate a buffer for will be in the memory map size variable. So we'll call it with zero first to get that filled out and then allocate an actual buffer with that size. So let's do that. Send zero for map size, we'll say. Okay. So I passed in 
I passed in a memory map here. It's not filled out, so we can like mem set it or do something. Let's say, let's say it's gonna be filled with zeros, so I have, I know what the values are. I know this is gonna be null, basically, and these are gonna be zero. Okay, then I just have to dereference and get those values, so. I'll have memory map size. It needs to. It needs a pointer, so that'll be an address. And we'll do that for all the other ones as well, basically. Uh, I don't need the address for that because that's already a pointer. I can rename these actually, so they're not just the regular names. I'll probably just, since we already know it's going to be a memory map, and I named it M map. I'm just gonna have this be size map. Size map key, do it more like C. Descriptor size and version. I don't care about the version, but that's fine. We gotta pass it in anyway. Size map key. And descriptor size and descriptor version. Okay, so this should give us an error, and I'll need status first, let me add a variable for that. It can be zero or success, that's fine. It'll be reset from this call. So let's say if it's there and it's not equal to, I think it's buffer too small, I don't think I have that defined actually. It was buffer too small, correct? Yes, okay. So buffer too small, that's gonna be in the protocols at the bottom, status code, so appendix D. Bad buffer size is four, buffer too small is five, okay. Buffer's not large enough to hold it, card size is returned in the appropriate parameter. All right, so it's five. So if I see where I have my errors here, okay, unsupported device error, so we'll just add in five here. Buffer too small. And that's five, okay. So if it's not buffer too small, that is how they spelled it, right? Yeah. If it's not buffer too small, say, hey, we have an error, that's not good. Probably error and leave. We'll just return the status, yeah. Okay, but if we did get an error and it was too small, that's fine. It should be that because we're passing in zero for the size. I guess I could clear it out whenever we get it though, just in case. Well, it'll it'll fill the values here. Yeah, I could clear it out when we get it. In case this is called from somewhere else somehow and it's not filled out. Size of star in map. Is that how this works? It is how it works, okay. So we should not get an error there. If I go to print, it says press any key to go back. So I know we probably got an error, but it might be too small, that's all right. Okay, so now we want to get, we want to allocate a buffer for the actual size. Because we should have the size returned within the size variable there. Initialized. Well, let's just do that. Okay, so I want to allocate a buffer for the actual memory map now that we have the size. And we can call allocate pool. Wherever I've previously used that. Just copy that. So it could not allocate memory for memory map. Just say buffer. Okay, but this is not going to work. At least when we call to get the actual memory map, we'll also get an error. It won't work, it'll return like an error that isn't too small, or it might return buffer too small again, actually. The issue is that when we call allocate pool or another allocate function like pages, that can add 
an additional descriptor in the memory map list, in the memory map itself. It can add another memory descriptor for this allocation. It could split a current region of memory into two, for example, so you'd have an additional space there. So the map size would not be big enough if it adds another entry to the end. So a good thing to do here, or what basically what you need to do is either add one or two memory descriptor size, <laughs> which it'll return. You need to add one or two entries worth of space according to the descriptor size. So what you can do is just add in that. So the, descript the descriptor size return should be accurate from the first call, but I can say we can allocate two extra. So allocate enough space for an additional, we'll say memory uh, descriptor. Just do that. We need to allocate enough space for an additional memory descriptor or two in the map due to this allocation itself. A little confusing, but you basically have to allocate some extra buffer space there. So the map itself is what you're going to send in. That's what we need to allocate and fill out. And we'll need an address. We'll need a void pointer. Actually, this would be the size. <laughs> So that would be a singular, singular thing. I believe we need a void pointer and allocate pool. I don't remember. I should remember. I don't remember. We need a void double pointer for the buffer. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's going to be that. The address of that. But I need the actual size. That's going to be in our mmap size now. And that should be allocated. Let's just make sure, let's just make sure that works so far. Yep, okay. All right, then we can call get memory map again because we'll have the correct size buffer now to hold the map. Call get memory map again to get the actual memory map now that the buffer is the correct size. So we can just call it the same as the first time. And that time I'll say if I couldn't get it, I'll say could not get UEFI memory map. Wah, wah. That'd be bad. But assuming we got that, then we actually got the memory map. We can just return. Well, we already filled out that data, didn't we? Yep, we'll just return. Everything's good. Okay. So we're going to assume we have a memory map there. We can print the, the values out. We'll say descriptor values. And we'll have some other totals we can come up with, I guess. So we'll have values there according to the size of the memory map and the descriptor size, which is not guaranteed to be the same as the EFI memory descriptor, unfortunately. We have our, our mmap value here. So I'll say mmap.size divided by mmap descriptor size. And that'll give the number of descriptors if we want to just iterate through them like in a, in a loop here. So let's say I have, I'll just say memory map. We'll have a size, that'll be a uint n. Maybe the number of descriptors. I'll have be a separate thing here. We'll have a key. I could print the key value, I guess. I'm not going to mess with the memory in the map or allocate or deallocate, so the map, the map key won't change if I call the get memory map function and then like load the kernel up here. I'm just trying to think about if the key would change. I don't think it would. So I'll just print that. Okay, that seems reasonable. So this would be size over descriptor size. I could print that. I don't know if this is going to be too much data on one line or not, but that's fine. Size over and map.key. Okay. Then we'll do nothing here and then press any key. So let's see what that looks like. If I properly in the statement. 
Size 5424, descriptor size 48. Yeah, so that's larger than the EFI memory descriptor size of 40. Number descriptors 113, key 98D. Okay. That's reasonable. I can just show that here. That I'll remove in a second for debugging. This will be a U. And that'll be size of if I memory descriptor, just to prove that I'm not lying to you, right? Yeah, so the normal size is 40 with the padded bytes, unless you do packed, and then it'll be 32, but that's still a far cry from 48, so that's why you can't just offset by the descriptor size from the memory map. You're going to get wrong and invalid values. That's an easy thing to mess up, but I messed up a lot, so keep that in mind. So if we want to get the actual values in the memory map, we can get a pointer, I'll just say descriptor, we can get a pointer to, if we want to do, you know, fancy pointer arithmetic here, you don't have to, to make more sense, but that's what I'm going to do. So I guess the descriptors I'll just put underneath and that's fine. Yeah, that'll be fine. So let's have just a byte wise pointer. So I know what I'm working with for the, for the memory map itself, which is going to be the map within the mmap variable. So that's an EFI descriptor, but I'm going to change it to this to get pointer arithmetic. We'll have I times whatever current descriptor we're on, so i times the descriptor size. Yeah, so that'll be the current descriptor offset from the base, which is going to be the memory map itself. We'll get a pointer to that for the descriptor, and that'll be all right. So I can't do size of EFI memory descriptor because that would be eight bytes off. So I have to do the actual size and multiply it by here. There's probably a better way to do it, but this will this will be all right. And I'll print out each one. So we'll say u, and that'll be i. That'll be like the number that we're going to do. And then we'll have values within the descriptor. So if we want to print these things out, for example, fit them all on one line, I'm going to just concatenate the, the verbiage here. So I'll have a type value. That'll be uint32, which I may or may not have to extend because my printf is not the best and might print bad values in data. We'll have a physical start, we'll say fizz. I'll, I'll print these in hexadecimal. We'll have a virtual start, we'll say vert. Like the cool things at the X Games. Although a street, I don't know if they have a street competition at the X Games, do they? They might. I think they probably do. I've only seen the vert with, you know, the big old half pipes and stuff. But anyway, the number of pages is gonna be, I'll just say pages. Number four kilobyte pages. So four KIB, that might be too much on the line. We'll see. I'll just do pages. And the attribute will have attribute bits, and that I can do probably hexadecimal, because they'll probably define it. Okay, and then at the end we'll say press any key to go back. We can print extra info, but I'll just see what that looks like so far before we go on. So that'll be the descriptor here, this pointer, and we'll offset by these values. So we'll have physical start, we'll have virtual start. We'll have the number of pages. If I can type, then we'll have the attributes. Okay. I'll just print them all in their own line. And to start off, we'll have I. So that works. Okay, so that should print everything out and then say press any key to go back. Assuming I didn't mess it up. Incompatible pointer types, initializing with an expression of type U8, yes. Okay, so I have to cast that again. So I wrapped it in a value, but I didn't cast it. Right, let's cast that sucker there. So it looks a little jank. I'll just do that. Pointer arithmetic and casting is always fun, but that's okay. Okay, so we do have 113. I might change it to where we just kind of page through, so we'll stop every so often. But these are examples, so you see at the bottom, at the bottom sort of is an invalid, type 0 is EFI reserved, so that memory is not, it's not even in our physical RAM most likely, but it is in the address space. So if that looks weird, you're like, I only have 8 or 16 gigs of RAM, why is it up here so high? Uh, well, I mean, this is QEMU as well, but I only gave it 256 megs, and that's definitely way above that value. So the amount of physical RAM you have is a total amount of space, you know, accessible by the processor and, and, and hardware and all. But the total amount 
of addressable values of addresses is not limited to the amount of physical RAM you have. The total address space for x64 is uh, 57 bits, I think, with five level paging, or 48, or 52, or something like that, with four level paging. If a physical address extension, it might just be 40, 48, I think, because then plus nine bits is is 57. But anyway. You have a total amount of address space, which is so many terabytes or petabytes or whatever. Uh, the amount limited to your RAM is, you know, the amount that's physically in your RAM at the moment, but the amount that can be accessed, especially in virtual addresses, they can be anything. You'll see the firmware reserves its own space. So the EFI firmware can be over in, you know, La La Land somewhere up in the clouds. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect your physical RAM. Other devices may have stuff outside the physical range as well. If, for example, the memory mapped I.O., and that might not be in your physical address space. There's usually a memory hole between 3 and 4 gigs, I read, I think for PCIe and other devices. So stuff like that will be outside of the range if you're wondering why these values are way above the amount of RAM you actually have. It's because the address space is not limited to your physical RAM. So we can we can also have like a count for that thing. I'll just say um, total bytes maybe or usable, usable memory. I'll say usable bytes. I'll say usable in quotes, I guess. Usable memory for an OS or similar. Not firmware reserved, we'll say. Not firmware or device reserved. And that's where that type attribute comes in here. So I can say if we have a specific type in there. So if it's the type that isn't EFI reserved memory, but. Um, yeah, EFI memory type, one of these. So basically if it's loader code, loader data, boot services coder data, we can check for that, or conventional memory. Reclaim technically, but I'll leave it out for now because we need to actually reclaim it from ACPI later probably, not IO, not PAL code, not, well, persistent counts as conventional, so I'll put that there. And not the unaccepted or max. So if it's one of these types, basically, Uh, then we're good to go. I'll just do that and try to think how do I repeat. Uh, I can just, I had a brain fart there for a second. <laughs> I can just like do this, right? And then, yeah, copy it there. This is slow, but that's all right. Forgot how to do that as a, as a Vim macro in my head. So if it's one of these things, I can replace the comma with space or and I need to actually do that. And there we go. I'm trying to get better of him, but my brain does not work on the fly when I'm trying to talk. It's a lot harder, <laughs> but that's okay. If we have these things, then I can add the number of usable bytes according to the number of pages times 4K. So that's what I'm going to do here, just as an example. So number of pages times 4,096 or 1,000 in hex if you prefer. I'll say 4,096. Yeah, and I'll go with that. We can print that out at the bottom. We'll have it below there. So let's say usable memory. We'll have that in maybe hexadecimal or regular. I can print it in bytes. Yeah, we'll have regular. And then we'll say We'll have megabytes as well, and if you have a bunch of stuff, like on my laptop, I'll have gigabytes. On QEMU, I only have 256 megs, so there'll be a little bit less than that, because some some part of your physical RAM, even though it's not you know the total amount of address space anyway, but a part of your physical RAM will still be reserved for EFI or for devices and things. So even if you have, say, 500 megs of RAM available, you're not going to have that much in usable memory of these types. You'll have a little bit less. It won't be half, shouldn't be half, unless you have a weird system, but you will have a little bit less, maybe 5, 10% at most. You know, there's similar things with microcontrollers on other devices, like your your storage, your hard drive, or SSD, you're not going to get a full two terabytes, for example. You'll get like 300 megs less because there's stuff reserved <laughs> for the hardware, but that's okay. We'll just have these values here. We'll say this will just be usable bytes, if I can type. Can't type. And we'll have that same thing there, except this will be divided by 
can we can say 1024 times two i know it's not it'll be probably optimized away to one shift left by 20. you can also do that i think this helps me visibly see it if i do this so 1024 times two is you know kilobytes 1024 kilobytes is a megabyte and then 1024 megabytes is a gigabyte so we'll just do that gigabyte rather but okay so that would be the totals and then any key to go back so we'll see what that looks like it'll still print everything so let's say need to end that as well let's say if i is divisible by maybe 20 although i don't want it to stop to begin with so let's say just for example 20 or 21 or so because the default screen will be 80 by 24 so let's just say every 20 lines you can just press a key to go on so let's just do that yeah and that'll be a one-liner let's just say pause pause every around 20 lines okay so i should also have so that way you can see them so they don't just scroll immediately and i don't want to think about making a more more involved paging system here just for one screen so memory map size descriptor size 113 descriptors we have a key which was iterated since last time i guess 99d so these are the first things reported in memory it's not guaranteed to be in order the qemu return memory map probably is but this isn't guaranteed to necessarily be in sorted ascending order on the physical address but it does work out nicely if it is of course so we have random types and i should have like an enum to string just basic map or function uh, three is i don't remember i can look that back up which i think was in allocate pages zero one two three three is boot services code four is boot services data so one and two would be loader code and data three and four would be boot services code and data seven is conventional memory so really you'd be looking for one through four and seven for traditional memory that you can use anything else would be reserved so we have four a lot of fours boot services code or data there or well yeah boot services data and seven conventional memory so 10,000 pages there at bb95 that's pretty good we have other stuff that's four and three so still boot services code smaller amounts of pages maybe from random allocations the firmware did or if you do a runtime allocation with allocate pool or memory or pages sorry <laughs> that'd probably be there you know the amount of pages should be equal to the last whatever allocation you have the attribute bits i didn't look at too closely so i can go back to that because usually there a lot of the times they're going to be f right so f in this case probably just means eight four two and one so it'll be what is this uh not cacheable so we'll have an uncacheable attribute a right a memory cacheability right combining i was gonna say right cacheable so uncacheable if you want right combining we'll have right through and right back i think yes so uncacheable right combine right through right back combine that's eight plus four plus two plus one which is 15 which is f Usually the only other one I see, it, it might start with the top bit set, which says it's runtime memory. Or maybe non-volatile as well, but... Runtime is a runtime memory attribute. It needs to be given a virtual mapping by the OS. If you call set virtual address map, you could set up paging yourself after, set, uh, after exiting boot services, and you don't necessarily have to call this. I don't think it's necessary. But if you want to set up you know, virtual memory, you can do that before exiting. That's just, we have a couple of runtime attributes there at a 98 and 99. And then at the end of memory, EFI and QEMU world, at least OVMF, EFI re reserves a whole bunch of stuff for itself. Three million pages there. So you don't want to count that as usable memory. You'll get a value that's like 12 gigs or something for this. But you'll see usable memory here that I added up. It's not exactly 256 megs. It's 250. It's a little bit less. Uh, with integer zero-based indexing and truncation, it, it would probably say 255 at most anyway, but you have a little bit less because stuff's reserved. So that's the basics of printing the memory map and, uh, and getting the memory map and a little function for that. So to pass it over, make sure we can still call our kernel. I'll do that here since I already have the kernel parms, I believe. Yeah, I have kparms which I'm putting there. Let's just put that closer to where it's used. 
So I'll say initialize kernel parameters. We set the GOP mode, get memory map. We'll have kparms.mmap, which is what I called it. Uh, called it mmap, yep, okay. So I'll pass that in to get memory map, kparms.mmap, which will give us an error if it doesn't succeed and it returns an EFI status. So just in case, we'll say if EFI error get memory map, and then I'll pass in an address to that because it takes that as a pointer. Then I'll just probably return or I'll go to I'll go to cleanup and skip over the other stuff. Is that two? Yeah, another parenthesis there. Which means I can just do that. Okay, and it'll have the info in there. Then we can exit boot services with the key returned within that memory map which I can check status as well on that. Or I can just check if it doesn't work. So this would be exit boot services and we need to pass that in the memory map and the key. Uh, let's just do all caps here. The image handle and the key. So the image handle and my stuff is global, right? Yeah, I made, it, I made it there global. Should rename that and put that into the EFI live probably, but I can pass that in because that'll be filled in at the, the start of, yeah, the entry point for my init function. It sets that, okay. I just had to re-remember that. So we pass in the image and the map key, that's gonna be an mmap.key, right? Yeah, .key. And map has the key. That's the last map key from get memory map, and that should be good. I believe those are. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I believe those are not pointers. They're not. They're plain values there. All right. I would call error probably for this. Let's just do that. So it could not exit boot services. Should not be good. And we'd press the key to go back, all right. So if we could exit, then we're gone. We can still call this with the parms. Uh, so let's see, moment of truth, can we call? No, we can Undeclared function, because this is after I called this stuff. Yep, okay. Let's put get memory map above that. <laughs> Then, and the mmap key is not defined, undeclared identifier, mmap, okay. Which is here, because it's in kparms. Can't, can't type make, all right, there we go. Okay, now moment of truth. We have the memory map. We should be able to print that out and actually go back and load the kernel still, so let's check that. Load kernel, we have the PE file here, and we can load it. Hey, you don't have to do anything else. You just exit boot services. You load, you get the memory map. We can pass it into our kernel from there. So I think we're good to go. I'll have a little video of this loading on my laptop if we're good, but we should be good to go there. That's a simplish example. Yeah, under an hour, checking my phone timer. of getting the memory map, printing it out as a, at a basic level, and then just calling exit boot services. You know, a little good abstraction there with that. I'm going to move some some more of this other stuff that I've had, like printing and, and you know, the mem set and everything that isn't strictly EFI. I'll move that into the live header file just to have this main file be a little more cleaned up. Uh, but other than that, that's all I'm going to do on this video. Since we can print and load the kernel, I think we're good to go there. I could say dude, one extra thing if you're messing with this and you want to do a flat binary kernel. You want to make sure that your entry point is at the start of the text section or the start of executable code. If you have another function here, let's just say get get a color to draw, right? And we'll have an internal, maybe it can be a static variable where we can pass in something. Uh, let's say choice, if, I'll switch, it doesn't matter here. 
Let's say we pass in a one or a two to choose like a color to draw. We'll have default to do nothing. Um, like down here. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. We'll just return that, and that's light gray. Should have copied that text actually. In case two, we'll do this. You know, I can do like different colors, but I'll just keep the same ones right here. So let's say. color one, and then this will be get color two. Get rid of that. Should have done F zero. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is say that this code, if we make a flat binary, this code will be put in probably at the start of text or the start of executable code, not our entry point, even though we set the entry point and the linker flags or the linker script, if you will. So this will probably break. So I just want to show that because I've had that happen for other people where it did break. So if we make a binary, this is using Clang, but it'd be it'd be the same thing with the GCC here. I'm setting in as a portable, uh, not a portable, position independent rather, <laughs> executable file doing that. I don't have a linker script. It does set the entry point, but that's not really going to matter here. So it's in kernel.c, function de definition is not allowed because I didn't do that correctly. Um, return choice by default, I probably should do. I know I didn't end this switch, that's my bad. We'll just do that. Okay, so expression result unused at 13. I'll get rid of that as well. Um, because I should return that. I should look at what I'm doing when I'm doing it, right? <laughs> should actually read what I'm doing. So if I go to load kernel, we don't know what it is. It's a flat binary. It's not going to load. It's not going to do anything. It's going to spin its wheels and do nothing. I press the key, but nothing's happening. And that's because the stuff at, at the start of our file here does not work. So what you want to do is either move this after this function or set up a linker script and put something like an extra section that you put main at. So it's annoying, but you'll have to do that in this case. So if you got an errors and you set up your file like this, that's why. I'm going to leave this at the top for an example. This will be a function declaration. Forward function declaration. And this I'll move after main so we can call it from main. Okay, so that'll remake the kernel binary. And now if I load it, it'll load, right? And that's because the code in kernel is going to be put at the start of executable code, at the start of the text section, or what have you. So if you don't want to do it like this, and you want the stuff to be before main, you can do that as well. You'll just have to add in an extra section here for a linker. So let's try a little thing here. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do it the other way because I don't like having extra files. But for the purpose of example, we'll have this. Sections, you can put an entry point here, it's not going to matter. Uh, we can start at zero, it'll start at zero by default, so we shouldn't need to do this. But at the start of text, we'll say we have an extra section, and I'll say keep everything in that section. We'll say k main or kernel main, our kernel section, if you will, that's fine. And then after that, we'll put text, usually. Uh, well, I'm not going to have this. Usually, the files I've been working with only really need executables, rather. Only really need text data, RO data, and BSS if you have some stuff. So, our read, our readable, writable memory, our read-only memory, and our initialized or uninitialized data, our block, block symbol segment. And then you can discard comments and other things, but really, I only need these, typically. So, and I usually need to put keep. You could... You might be able to get away with just putting this before the text section, but I'm putting it I'm putting it here so I explicitly say we need this in the final binary that we're linking with it. So then I can add an attribute to my entry point here. 
and say attribute. This is only in Clanger GCC, of course, annoyingly, but that's all right. It's not in the C standard section. I called it dot kernel, so we'll put it in there. You just specify the function's gonna have that section name, and then you're putting that section at the start of the text section before all the other text stuff is linked in. Not like the social media site. So then we have kernel bin here. Instead of, you can still put an entry point or else it'll say it probably can't find it, but this doesn't really affect where it's gonna end up. You can put a capital T and then give the linker script, which is kernel LD, I believe. Yeah, kernel LD. And then that'll tell it to use that to link this thing with. So then if I make it, I uh, need an extra parenthesis, I need number three. I'm bad at threes, just like Valve. It'll link it in with that explicit linker script there. And if I load the kernel, it'll work. So that's all that's doing there. So if you want, it depends how you want your file laid out pretty much. If you don't want to do this, then you can always have main be basically the first actually defined function body in your program. And again, this is only for a flat binary if you don't want to use an L for PE and load those things. Either have main be the first or give it a section and, and keep it in the linker script, we'll say. I'm not going to do that because I like things being a little simpler, but I might go and, and do this later. I don't know. But I'm going to do the sort of have the, the function declaration there, which I didn't save in my jump list, so that's okay. So I'll do that. And then I won't need to do the linker script in the make file. And I can get rid of that, and I can remake it. Plain, plain flat binary, and it loads. Okay. So I just wanted to show that because that came up in, in discussion a little bit on on the Discord, I think. But anyway, that's what I'm going to do for this video. The next one, I may have a little menu of choices to install, make a sort of installer for this, uh, this bootloader onto another drive. So we, we can already get the drives. From, uh, from the block IO partitions, you know, on an actual machine, there will be more than this. And this is assuming that all your drives have more than one partition, so you don't get any, we'll say, false negatives or false positives for the, uh, something being the entire disk, like the top of disk image thing there. But I can make a little menu that has everything for the full disk, not a partition, or we can choose a partition. I don't know. I might do a full disk to be simpler. But every singular disk that's found on your machine we can write this bootloader onto that disk with uh, with read and write blocks, we'll say. And then you can reboot and choose that <laughs> and on your given machine and it'll be written to that drive and you can sort of boot into this bootloader. Or we can have a check or a file or something that's written that says this was written to the drive. Don't reload the bootloader, just go ahead and load the kernel and bypass the bootloader. And that way we'll sort of install the whole thing on a different machine. So I think I might do that on the next one, and then that might be the end. After that, I might mess with other silly stuff or set up a GDT or IDT or something that isn't strictly GD that that isn't strictly EFI land, but more OS land. We'll see. But that's what I might do on the next one. Until then, thank you for watching. Thank you for waiting. Greatly appreciate it, and I'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Cheers. Hey, I had one extra thing here it actually turns out i do have to use the linker script for the binaries i don't know what changed if i didn't save things correctly or it was just i don't know a, a passing thing but with clang or with gcc the mingw version um, i had to add a couple changes i am using a linker script in both of these recipes for the flat binary again the elf and pe don't matter They're, they don't need this special stuff but if you want a flat binary and i want to support them all you do need that linker script. With MinGW, I got errors for relocations not being correct. They were like below text and X data or whatever. So you can get around that by, by explicitly setting the image base of the portable executable file that's generated here. When you're linking it in, you're going to link it against an image base. If you do zero instead of whatever the default is, one meg or gig or whatever, if you do zero, then it doesn't have issues relocating before the sections or however the, the error said. I can show that here. If I just do, I'll remove the bin and we'll make it and we say relocation truncated to fit at these P data values. It, it doesn't like it. If you set the image base for the portable executable to zero, 
then it is okay with that, and we don't get that error anymore. So that's a double dash, a long flag. I like double dash. We'll just set that to zero. We make the, the binary. And then if I load it, we can actually load it again. Before it was, it was just frozen, but I can load it if I do that. And the same with Clang. So actually, for the flat binary, I am going to end up using... Well, we can make clean as well. I am going to end up using the, uh, the linker script, yeah, which I have there. So I, I did that. One other thing I added that is separate from that was just in print memory map. At the end, I freed the allocated pool because we're allocating a pool from git memory map. So if you call this a bunch of times, it was, you know, just allocating more memory. So that was sort of a memory leak, a leak there. So we just call free pool to free the pool of memory allocated by git memory map right here. So that's all. That's really the only changes I did. I fixed a thing. I think I still have a typo. Yeah. I still have a couple typos, but that's fine. Anyway. We fix the thing, and if you want flat binaries, it works. Again, <laughs> I'll just explicitly, and I'll just print the memory map a bunch of times to make sure we can still load the curl and, every, and everything. So, okay. Just to make sure, yeah. If you want to make a flat binary and you want to do it with GCC, you need to set the image base to something so the relocations work. I set it to zero as a, a simple thing. And in here, we, we did that. So, I am using the section attribute now because it wasn't working without it for some reason. It was inconsistent. It did like one out of every five times. It depends. Depends what exactly what code I used here. But anyway, if we do it like this, then, you know, we can have this sort of laid out however we want. And the sections is what I think I had in the first part, which is just keeping the kernel there explicitly for kmain, the entry point, and putting the stuff here. If you want to put entry in this now, you can. That's something you can add here, entry k main as well. And then you should not need to add the dash e k main in these lines. I believe, yeah, because it uses that and it, it uses that as the entry point from there. So we can add entry there and, and not need it on the flat binary lines. I guess that makes it slightly simpler. But anyway, you can set the output format in here too, but I don't want to push my luck right now. So I'm going to leave it at those. <laughs> and just keep it that way, and yeah. Sorry about that if I broke it between the first part and this one. That's why I'm adding this in now, probably at the end of the video. So thanks for watching again. I'm going to enjoy my tea and get some good rest tonight. So see you on the next one. Still appreciate it. Cheers.